Rod, a very good morning to you. Good morning, mate. When one snowflake falls on London, <laughs> nine million snowflakes go berserk. I know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, mate. It's, it's true. Uh, I mean, no, listen, it's true. I mean, there was an inordinate amount of snow last night, much more than there normally is, I have to say. And I know that you guys in the hardy north have got probably much more snow to worry about than we have. But, I mean, you can't really avoid it. A lot of people have not gone to work this morning just because they don't fancy it. I remember walking from Streatham to uh, Broadcasting House when I was working for the BBC back in the late 80s. Yeah. Uh, walking, well, it must be about six, seven miles through snow drifts. Yes. In order to get to work. Yes. Uh, but I, I think people people no longer feel they need to go to work anymore. No. I don't know if you saw a recent survey of, uh, of young people. I think it was something like a quarter... Th uh, have decided that they have no intention of entering the job market. Yes. Uh, there's this sense of entitlement, you know, uh, about it. Uh, well, I'm up here in the, uh, on the Northumberland border uh, in County Durham in the middle of the Pennines, and it's not that cold. I mean, it's, it's zero, you know. It's, yeah. it's what we call winter. <laughs> well, exactly right. I mean, proper cold, right, is when I was in Chicago once and I went out of the hotel and they actually had a, um, a warning in the hotel to say, please, we're not joking, just don't go out. It really is very, very yeah. cold. And it was something like minus 10 Fahrenheit, you know, and you went out and breathing into a scarf that I had around my neck made the scarf so hard it solidified. I could actually punch myself in the face and not feel it. That's how cold it was. And I mean, Lake yeah. Michigan was frozen. That was properly cold. That's proper cold, yeah, that's proper cold. Yeah. But, you know, here we are. We're at the start of the worst week for travelling, probably in the history of Britain. There's a general strike starting, basically, tomorrow, which is going to rope in the railways, rope in the NHS, rope in, um, you know, ambulance drivers, paramedics, all of that, plus border forces going... I mean, they're all going on strike. What are we going to do? You know, I've been thinking about it, and I, and I, I, I think that with capitalism, and with, particularly in our country... There's a reset every 40 or 50 years. And I think that's what's happening now, mm. just as it happened in 1978 uh, and just as it happened in 1929. It, it, and, it, and it's when... Because what, what we try to do with welfare capitalism is regulate it so that the people get a decent wage and the industry still makes a profit. What, what, what's happened over the last 20 years is that wages have been falling in relation to, you know, consumer goods... Um, they, they, we are a low-waged economy, much as we were in 78, much as we were in 29. And this is across a whole bunch of professions and trades. Mm. And I think that this is another one of those great resets where people come out and ask for 20% pay rises, uh, which they may well feel they're entitled to. I, I don't feel a huge anger towards any of the strikers, apart from uh, the railway unions whose targeting of Christmas weeks uh, seems to be an act of utter spite towards, um, you know, all the people who wish to see their families at Christmas. Yes. Also, they're being very um, disingenuous about it, making out that we should be angry with the rail operating uh, companies rather than with them. Well... You know, the rail well, operating indeed. companies aren't very, good, aren't very good at what they do either, but they're not the ones disrupting the trains. Well, no, 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 I agree. And you probably disagree with me on this, but I think we should have a state-run rail network. No, uh, listen, I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, it, as, long as, it's both, better, as long as it's better than it was when they ran it before. Yeah, well, we both remember the glory days of British Rail, don't yeah. we, mate? Um, uh, yeah, uh, and, and there are problems with, with the state running the rail network and, you know, the lack of kind of entrepreneurial and innovation uh, that you sometimes don't get with nationalised companies. Would we have seen the javelin trade in the southeast of England under nationalisation? You know, I have my doubts about mm. that. Uh, but but still, yeah, no, I, I, the, the, the rail unions, you know, led by people who have sympathies for North Korea and Russia, mm. uh, uh, genuinely would have been what Margaret Thatcher called the enemy within. Right. Uh, but it's the, it's the spite directed at, at the rest of us that annoys me. That being said, you know, we have had a low-wage economy for too long and everyone knows it's a low-wage economy. Here's a way of it not being one. <laughs> you know, people asking for 20% pay rise. Yes. You know, that, that's, 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 it's a natural occurrence, I think. Well, perhaps. I mean, the trouble with the way that the railways were run before when they were nationalised was that the unions basically decided what was going to happen. The unions really ran the railways. The, the, you know, the, yeah. the, the government never got anywhere near it. And no, all I hear about from people who know 
people who work on the railways is they don't do very much work. I was talking to somebody at the weekend uh, whose best friend is a signalman. Apparently he only works two days a week and spends the rest of the time running a horse farm. You know, it's a bit like the old days of the printers. You know, they've all got other jobs because they don't have to work very much. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's true. I mean, it's also true that, that, I mean, the reason our railways are in the state they're in is that when they were uh, nationalised, when they were in public ownership um, and before, uh, there was no investment in them. You know, we have starved our rail networks of investment for more than 200 years. Well, mm. about 200 years. You know, we just haven't put the money in. Um and we still have the infrastructure from, you know, the, the uh, 1800s. It's, it's a real problem. Mm. And instead we put it all into HS2. Let's talk about England before we forget uh, that yes. the World Cup has once again... Can come I to... run through the card on it? Yes, please do. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been saying this for four years. And, it, and, and I suppose there is some consolation that uh, a few of the football experts are now saying it themselves which is that Gareth Southgate is not a very good manager. <laughs> uh, so, 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 you know, uh, let's, have a look at, let's have a look at Saturday night's performance. Um, we didn't take the game to the French in the first half. We played a containing game in the, in the first half. Now, some teams play containing games because they have a very strong defence. Yeah. We don't. Um, we have a very strong attack. And every time we attacked, there was no one in the penalty area to pick up those crosses from Bakayo mm. Saka or from uh, Kyle Walker or from whoever was putting the ball into the box. There was a complete absence in the penalty area. We had virtually no uh, direct shots either on target or off target in the penalty area mm. in that first half. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was atrocious. Second half, uh, we begin to get on top. We get a penalty. Uh, but the big difference between the two teams, uh, people were, were saying that France and England are pretty evenly matched, uh, and indeed they are. They're probably the two best teams in the tournament in terms of the players they've got. Yes. Uh, but the thing which gave us the edge was the bench, that we have far greater strength in depth mm. than France. What did we therefore not do? <laughs> <laughs> substitute people. I know. Substitute people. I mean, he didn't even, and, I can't remember it, if it was Grealish or Rashford that came on two minutes from the end. And you kind of go, what do you think he's going to do? Come out and, you know. well, or, or Jack Grealish, one minute before the end of yeah. eight minutes of extra time. Or worse than that, when he did make his substitution, who did he decide to take off? He had a look around his team and he thought, the player who's causing most trouble to the French is Saka. Mm. I think I'll take him off. Yes. Because it'll confuse them. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I just... Do well, it certainly confused everybody else. It confused everybody else. He cannot react to adverse uh, uh, adverse conditions in the game. He cannot no. react. My, my impression of it, 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 quite simply, was this, that the French wanted it more. They were bullies which is entirely how you win tournaments and how you win football matches. And England are suffering, in my view, from an attack of overly nice behaviour. You know, actually, when I put out a tweet at the weekend, which has now reached a million hits, because I was critical of Harry Kane, and, of course, that's something you can't do. The front page of The Sun on Saturday called him a hero. I'm going, sorry? <laughs> Why is he a hero? He missed a penalty. He's paid to hit the target. He didn't even hit the target. And the bottom line is, is that they're too nice. And somebody actually tweeted me, and this is when you know that it's all gone horribly wrong for the football fans of England. This guy said, I want my sons to look up to Gareth Southgate, whether it's doing the right thing or winning the World Cup. Really? Yeah, Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. But the trouble is, that's the view that the, that the Football Association have as well. He right. has been... He, he has had the finest crop of England players, I think, possibly in history. Mm. Uh, he managed to get us relegated from the Nations League with the worst series of results since the 1920s. You know? Mm. Uh, he threw away <clears throat> an astonishing opportunity against Italy uh, in the Euros final. Yeah. Uh, that is a game we could and should have won. He was way, way, way too late in reacting to changes which his opposite number... Uh, Mancini had already uh, um, uh, put in place. Mm. Uh, he failed again in the in the semi-final against Croatia, again failing to react in time. And his performance on Saturday was bad. Now, Harry Kane, you know, um, uh, that ball from the penalty, I think, has ended up somewhere near the Iranian coastline. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> even close, was it? No. But, nowhere but near. Fa- nowhere near. But in fairness to Kane, you know, he scores nine out of ten penalties, and 
therefore statistically one time in ten is going to miss. Uh, you no, know. I get all that, uh, but it's but it's not just about the penalty, is it? It's about the whole thing. I mean, it may. Somebody said to me uh, the other day, he may well have scored that penalty, and then we could have gone on to extra time and lost to, in, on penalties. You know, that that can happen. It was yeah. just the the nature of the way that you know France just seemed to do what they wanted. They, you could argue the referee was a little bit biased, but you know, in the end, they were the ones bullying the England players off the ball. Uh, yeah, I don't think the ref was biased. I just think it was a half wit. Yes. Um, and it's also true that brilliant player though Bakayo Saka is, and he is, uh, he does go down pretty easily. Um, you know, he goes down quicker than yeah. George Michael in a public lavatory, uh, <laughs> as, as one, one might say. Uh, well, you uh, may uh, well possibly allegedly, say yes, allegedly. Um, yes. But but no, it was the, the game was mismanaged. Yes. You know, and and all the big games that Gareth Southgate has come up against. He has mismanaged them. You know, I don't believe that we should win every tournament we enter, but I do believe that with these players, we've had a chance to win two, perhaps three tournaments, mm. and it's been blown away by bad management. Yes. Uh, I would I would like him to go and run a whelk stall in Grimsby for the next <laughs> couple of years. Uh, no, I don't... I it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't of, be a top division whelk stall either. It would, no, it would, be a, it would be a League One whelk stall. Yeah. Um, you know, because of course his previous, uh, he, he was okay with the England use ish. Um, he was a pretty awful at Middlesbrough, and that's his only other yeah. experience. And that's know? all he's ever done. Um, and he's up against somebody like Didier done. Deschamps, you know, who's coached some quite interesting teams in the past. Yeah, yeah, Didier Deschamps is a, is a class act, no question about that. And I also thought Deschamps was very generous in his post match assessment, you know, where he said, that France were maybe a bit lucky at times, um, but but no, the, the, the problem has been is that uh, is that the kind of Southgate mentality has a stranglehold not only on the FA, but also it's a bit like wokeism. Yeah, <laughs> but it also it has a stranglehold on 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 nearly all the reporters who report about that they're all his friends, and I, he seems to be a really nice bloke, Southgate. I'm sure and he's is. done a few things which are good. He's managed. He's managed to break down the divisions between the the players from the from the rival championship tier, yes. the rival Premier League teams. He's done that quite well. He's given them a sense of purpose. He's done that quite well. But he has no tactical sense. Yeah. And he's not a winner. He, That's the point. The point is, I mean, it's all very well that he's, he's a, a nice man and he's very pleasant company in a very boring, dull sort of way. But if you look at all the successful sporting individuals and teams, they're not very nice, because you have to not be very nice to win. No. No, that's right. No, they're usually a bit of a bastard, if yeah. you can put it like that. Exactly. Um, uh, and I don't doubt that he's an intelligent, well-spoken bloke. Um, but I, I think, you know, I mean, th there is the issue of the knee, which has become an absurdity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when, when England take it and America doesn't, you, you know, right. you, you know that something is... is and, and but it's parroted these days by ITV and the BBC yeah. when they're commentating on it. This is to show inclusivity. No, it's not. It wasn't to show inclusivity at the start. It was to talk about uh, Black Lives Matter. That yeah. is where it comes from. Right. Black Lives Matter, yes. which has since changed its name to Buy Larger Mansions. By the way, yeah, but it also um, comes so from it, Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Colin Kaepernick used to take the knee during the national anthem because traditionally in the NFL you stand for the national anthem. He yeah. took the knee as a demonstration yeah, against right. the United States of America. So if they really want to do it properly, they should kneel during the national anthem, which would then be an attack on their own country, which presumably would then lead to them all being fired. Yeah, well, do you know, uh, I think there's some people who think that. I was down at my local shops talking to an, uh, uh, an old lad who's a Sunderland supporter, and I said, will you be watching uh, the, the England game? This was before the Senegal game. Yeah. He said, no, I didn't even know it was on. He said, I'm not watching that shower. Uh, they disrespect my country. Yes, interesting. Uh, and I think there's quite a few people. There is a lot of that. There wasn't much uh, England flaggery on display, that's for sure. I only saw maybe two cars in the whole no, couple of weeks. There, oh. the, the, no, but the worst thing is that there were no spiteful chants at the French. You know, how can we 
as a nation, play France in a game of football, and no one is singing, if it wasn't for the English, you'd be kraut. Yes. How, can, how can that not happen? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you how it can not happen, because the only people who could afford to go and watch them uh, in Qatar uh, were rather well-dressed, uh, rather well-furnished, shall we say, yes. England fans. They weren't the normal common or garden England fan. Uh, they were people who'd shelled out about 10 grand per game, I think. But there we are. Listen, before I let you go, we must talk about your centre ground piece in the uh, Sunday Times. Very good. Starmer huffs and puffs for the centre ground, uh, but he isn't going to find many voters there. Yeah, you see, I, I think it, it, it was a mistaken piece by David Aronovich, who, who uh, is a very, very elegant and, and talented writer and wrong about almost everything that has ever happened, <laughs> uh, including, including the Iraq. He still thinks that weapons of mass destruction will be found in Iraq. Yeah, they're still you looking. Yeah. And he's still looking for, just for David. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, it... it, it, it uh, it, it, it's an illusion that, that the voters are moving towards the centre ground. If you look at issues like wokeism, the country is hugely against, and the opinion polls support this, you know. 70% of people don't think that uh, men who transition to being women should play against women in mm. sport. Um, uh, people don't agree with decolonising uh, curricula, you know, they don't agree with any of that. They're very hard line on it. Um, by the same token, they also quite like the idea of nationalising the utilities, and a higher rate of income tax. So, so in both senses, the the public, and when you add in green issues as well, that uh, ramps it up even more. Uh, on on most issues, the public is far more radical than is the uh, than are either of our two major parties, both to the left and to the right. Mm. Uh, and I, I, there, there is no indication that, that people want a kind of soft Jeremy Huntish consensus. No. None whatsoever. No, exactly right. Which takes us rather nicely back to England. He's the voice of the people and he's live. Jeremy Kyle brings you all the news, big opinions and debates, as well as great guests and no holds barred interviews. And he's talking about the issues you care about. And remember, if you're thinking about it, we will be talking about it. Join JK on Talk TV, Monday to Thursday at 7pm. The BBC employees are being given a 4.2% pay rise. Well, isn't that special? Isn't that marvellous? Because the BBC, apparently, according to Tim Davey, uh, who is the new director general, the BBC, he says, is the home of creative excellence and world-beating impartial journalism. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, well said, Mr Davey. Impartial journalism, it ain't. 6% of the people uh, in this country think it's trustworthy. I'm afraid that's not a very good record. 6% is also the number of people who were let go from the BBC. But do you know the BBC is the largest broadcaster in the world because they employ the most people in the world? They employ 22,000 people, right? Now, they claim that they've had cutbacks. They claim that because they didn't get a pay rise last year because of the pandemic, they should get one this year. And because inflation is at 7%, 4.2% isn't bad at all. Well, who do you know that's getting a 4.2% pay rise? It's an absolute outrage. At the time when their charter is under question, at a time when they're still charging pensioners uh, for a TV licence, I would say this. The BBC is skating on extremely thin ice. They let 6% of their uh, workforce go. That accounts for about 1,000 people. There's still 22,000 people working for the BBC, at the BBC. It's a shocking state of affairs. And quite frankly, I'm sick to death of paying uh, for what they do. I don't think I want to anymore. Thanks very much indeed. Cheerio. BBC, according to Tim Davey, the new boss, right, he says it's the home of creative excellence and world-beating impartial journalists. journalism. Um, sorry, I think he's not been watching the news lately, has he? Well, when I was at BBC WM, Mike, in Birmingham, yeah. um, there was open resentment and almost bordering on hostility towards Boris Johnson and conservatism. And, and that, naturally, I think, does indeed sort of leak its way into output. I, yeah. I always remember during the lockdown and the newsreader of the day, Rishi Sunak was doshing out billions and he was on the front page of the paper. And the newsreader said, I, I really want to like him, 
but I can't because he's a Tory. Mm. And that's the problem with the BBC, certainly at WM. I knew everybody's politics, and mm. I think that if you work for the BBC, you should leave your politics at home. Um, Boris Johnson, there was open resentment towards him. The, when the, uh, the, the exit poll came out on 2019, uh, the, there were journalists weeping um, in the office. I'm not kidding you. I came into work the next morning. <laughs> And I was told that there were people crying. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was told, just going back to the impartiality, I, I opened my show on the day after the 82-seat majority and said it was a stunning result for mm. the Tories. I was immediately told not to use the word stunning because it implies maybe some sort of editorial slant. And I was so incensed by this, right. I, I went to Dictionary Online, Googled stunning and just copied and pasted it and sent it to my boss. And, and, and that was... That was that was endemic. It, it was everywhere, Mike. Yeah, um, no, clearly. I mean, I've spoken to so many people um, who, during, before, and after the whole Brexit debate and the referendum, uh, would be called in to go on to any questions or to the question time. And if you were from the Brexit Party side of the the argument, or a Tory MP who wanted to to leave the European Union, you were literally treated like a leper. Um, you know, they didn't like want you to sit in the same room as them uh, before the show. They didn't really want to talk to you. Uh, if there was a conversation, it was always very leery. And people genuinely thought that you were some kind of, you know, mad racist bigot. And I've been told this personally by people that I know. Yeah. Uh, the regularly callers who had a brexit -y opinion wouldn't be allowed on air um, because it was bordering on... Well, I, I always remember, it, this is a good example, Mike. There, there was a story about a, 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 pr a jet that was being chartered by a farmer somewhere in England to mm. bring over Eastern European workers or something. And someone called in with an opinion, and, and he wasn't allowed on air. And I buzzed through to say, why, why isn't he allowed on air? And he, he was, you know, shut down as some sort of racist. He mm. wasn't a racist. He just had an opinion that differed from the very liberal management yeah. who, 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 who uh, staffed the BBC. Yeah. And you've told me in the past, Danny, they didn't like sort of elderly callers, they didn't like old people really at all, did they? Which is what the local sort of, uh, sort of national, the local radio um, stations they have all over the country are supposed to be providing a service for. Mike, this is the scandal, and I mentioned this to you on your fabulous show 12 months ago. The BBC now make over 75s, pay the £159 a year, but it's well known across the BBC that the managers don't want those voices on the radio. Why? because they don't want to put off the next generation of licence fee payers. Mike, you may remember that when I was jettisoned for being too old and too white at 50, not my words, the, the station's words, uh, we, we, we were on a downward trajectory because the station was going very woke, etc. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tragic for me to report, Mike, that the station has lost, I think, three quarters of its market share. Now, what that means to people who aren't in broadcasting is that one in 50 people who listen to the radio in Birmingham one in 50 listened to BBC WM. Blimey. When I was there, it was like one in 10 or one in 11. Yeah. And, and it's gone woke, and unfortunately it's gone broke. And, and they're continuing with this, this diversity yeah. um, play, Mike. And, and it, the, the listeners are just voting yeah. with their feet. Exactly right. But their reward, of course, uh, as we've been reading about today, is to get a 4.2% pay rise. And they're claiming, uh, and I didn't actually know this until I looked it up, the BBC is the biggest broadcaster in the world, right? In the world. Because they employ 22,000 people. They've let about 1,000 of them go, but they're probably all coming back through the back door working freelance. But yeah, the, local, the local radio network, which I rail about all the time, is about, I think there's 63 different local radio stations, including uh, BBC WM. Um, it's about a budget of 100 million quid, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a budget of around about 100 million pounds. And... Look, I love local radio, and I've got friends at local radio, and the journalists in the newsroom, Mike, deserve the 4% pay rise. Mm. The, the people who make the decisions don't deserve a hike in, uh, in their salaries, I believe. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy what's happening, but when one in 50 people listen, listen, if you and I were to go into business, and I say, I'm going to throw millions at a local radio station, Mike, and we're going to get one in 50 people who listen to the radio, they're mm. going to listen to our station, yeah. you would think I was berserk. Yeah. I know, it's absolutely mad. But also, 
Um, they make all these arguments all the time now as they do this kind of, you know, backward um, retreat from uh, the Charter because they've all accepted now, I think, that, you know, things are going to have to change. I mean, even Netflix have worked out that you can't continue uh, with what, whatever your planning model is because it changes all the time. You know, kids are watching more stuff on YouTube. You know, BBC, in very large part, is kind of redundant in many ways. I mean, I've even heard people now talking about getting rid of things like Radio 3, getting rid of things like, you know, BBC Three, which they already got rid of once, but somehow seems to have come back. You know, BBC Four, what do you need that for? You know, have BBC One and BBC Two, and if you want to make those, you know, free-to-air channels, fine. I, my belief is everything else, apart from, say, a much smaller network of local radio, disappears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's uh, one department that's shrouded in secrecy, and it's the commercial arm of the BBC and, and no one really knows how much money it makes but it, it sells incredibly popular programs all around the world Mike. Uh, it's shrouded in secrecy um, and, and I'd love to know exactly how many billions they had in, in, in the coffers. It, it's really peculiar though Mike because I, I take you back to your earlier question about mm. the future funding of the BBC. I'm passionate about radio, I, I love your radio station. The tragedy is I hear my old callers phoning you and, and, and it's galling <laughs> really? it's galling mike because yeah. they, they don't want to be exposed to the very diverse progressive yeah well i mean one of the reasons one, one of the reasons i did that rant at the top of the show was because we had a caller who said he was listening to bbc i think it was bbc shropshire and he yeah. said their take on the lee anderson story was so bizarre and biased that he had to switch it off because it you know true. they're making out that something that actually isn't true they followed the daily mirror line uh, which is that, you know, he's an evil Tory and he thinks poor people have only got themselves to blame. None of which he actually said. No, I, I remember driving into work, Mike. Do you remember know when, when Brexit was caught up in a, in a, log, in a traffic jam? I do remember uh, it very well. The and, and I remember driving in and the news was pumping out at the time, very one-sided partisan reporting of, for example, the CBI saying that if we leave the European Union, uh, the clouds are going to collapse and right. pet dogs are going to die. die. Yeah. Get, all of that sort of baloney. But it was never balanced, never balanced by right. somebody saying, however, the Brexit party say that's a load of rubbish. Yeah. And, and, and that was that was saturating the BBC. It was absolutely right. Well, listen, Danny, good to see you. Uh, we'll get you on again soon. Um, these bozos should not be getting a pay rise. I think it should be blocked. You know, if the prison minister can actually stop Belfield getting married, maybe, just maybe... Uh, we can stop this pay rise going uh, to these oiks at the BBC. Um, we've been talking about Just a Hall for quite a long time. We've been saying that sooner or later something bad will happen. Today something bad did happen. Mm. Luckily it wasn't actually a deadly incident, but two lorries crashed into each other because of a rolling roadblock put in place by the police because of these people clambering up a whole selection of different gantries on the M25. The police seem incapable of stopping them. Um, this is going to end badly, isn't it? Well, it's, I mean, we're a free society and you can protest, but this is totally, utterly irresponsible. Yeah. You know, they say that they'll have no future. The people on the M25 will have no future. Mm. And sooner or later, did these people realise what, what a, you know, a pile-up on the M25 or any motorway could look like? Yeah. Do you, know, you realise that 30 or 40 people have been killed in these pile-ups mm. in, in a bad one? Yes. Utterly, utterly irresponsible. Yeah. It's not proper protesting. It is verging on what you're talking about. And, uh, and I'm, I'm worried that if the police don't deal with it, the public will. Yes. The Terrorism Act of 2000, and I had a call this morning from a friend of mine uh, who knows a bit about this sort of thing. Mm. The ter Terrorism Act of 2000 defines terrorism both in and outside of the United Kingdom as the use of th or threat of one or more of the actions listed below. Now, let's have a look at the actions that they say represent terrorism. One, serious violence against a person. Yes. Serious damage to property. Yes. Endangering a person's life, other than that of the person committing the action. Yes. Yeah. Creating a serious risk to the health or safety of the public or a section of the public. Yes. Uh, action designed to seriously interfere with or seriously to disrupt an electronic system. That's it. All of those yeah. uh, qualify these people as terrorists. You step over me. a line. You step over a line as, as soon as you put yourself on a, a, a carriageway. Yeah. You put people in danger. It's utterly irresponsible. Yes. What, what's astonishing about these people is that they think they're moral doing this. Yeah. And it's them against society. Ordinary people. That policeman in, who I, I gather a policeman has been in yeah, on motorbike yeah. today. You know, he got up in the morning. He, they have to face his family. They, he got up in good faith to do a job for the public mm. and they've caused an accident it's just the sheer they're utterly childish yeah it's astonishing well they used to sit 
on the motorway, if you remember. I mean, there was a time when they yeah, yeah. glued themselves to the M25, yeah, yeah. which was equally yeah. as dangerous because they could have caused a pile-up then because the car drivers could either have run them over or been hit up the back end by, by screeching to a halt. Now they're climbing up on these uh, gantries Staggering. and causing the same problems. It's just ridiculous. But on, on but there's so way. many of them, William. This is what troubles yeah. me as well. Mm. I've spoken before about this woman in um, uh, California mm. uh, who is who's one who's a descendant of the Getty Oil Barons, mm. Mm. Um, who's got surprise, bucket, surprise. bucket loads of money yeah. and has gone mad, basically, and gone rogue. Mm. She is donating millions and millions of pounds to these mm. climate protesters all over the world. Mm. And she's getting, and so they're being bankrolled. Yeah. So they can afford to do this, because you do wonder sometimes, if there's been 600 odd arrests, mm. those are not necessarily all just, you know, one arrest, one person, but there's mm. hundreds of these people because they're being paid. There are hundreds. It's a job. There are hundreds, but it's them against society. Mm. I mean, if you, you know, um, how big is society? How big is the police force? Mm. I, I I gather there are 150 core activists that would do this type right. of thing, and I think society is big enough to to deal with them, and it must deal with them. I you know you, they shouldn't have to wait. I, yeah. I criticise this government a lot. They have to wait for a crisis yeah. before dealing with it. If you're stopping motorways, you're doing something extremely dangerous. Even oh, I hate to see people even in the cities, people stopping roads in London, and the police are watching them. And the public are having to deal with it. And mm. The police should lift them immediately and arrest them, put right. them in jail. Also, we now know that their main aim in life is to continue dis to disrupt, right? Yeah. And they managed to arrest a few people the other day before they did anything mm. because they had already figured out that there was a conspiracy and a plot to do uh, some mm. kind of criminal damage. Mm. So surely, on the great on the basis that they know that as soon as they let them go, they're going to go and do it again. Don't they let can them just re-arrest them. Don't let them go. Don't. Let, I mean, there's got to be some. There's going to be some charge. This mm. is a serious thing. Blocking a motorway is a serious matter. Well, under the Terrorism Act. They can be with. Uh, they can be um, twenty-eight days withheld, withheld or held for twenty-eight yeah. days yeah. without even a charge. Um, so I think that's what we start doing. We just well, start locking them up and you know build special detention centres for just stop oil. Perhaps we should. But I'll ask you a question: Do, Where where are these protesters um, in bringing to light the, the big polluters? Why are they going? Why are they having a crack at this society, which mm. is largely deindustrialised and it has decarbonised, right. and yet massive polluters like China have they? protested outside the Chinese Oh, no, they couldn't do that because that's too dangerous. They you might know, actually get beaten up by the Chinese uh, goons that, that operate within the Chinese embassy walls. Well, that's what happened in and Manchester. And that's what happened in Manchester. Yeah. The point is, right, that as I've, as I've said all week, this business of reparations and paying back oh, for all of the troubles yeah, yeah, that we've yeah. caused, supposedly now most of the um, really, really bad emissions uh, have happened in the past 10 to 15 years, yeah. mostly by the big newly industrialised countries like right. China, yeah. like India. Yeah. So actually, if... Anything did happen during the uh, Industrial Revolution. It was never anything as bad as what's happening now. So why is it our fault? Well, it's not. I mean, the other thing is that it's... Be I mean, obviously, industrialisation was polluting. But remember, there's a big difference between... I mean, the polluting that's happening now is with knowledge that it might be causing CO2 levels to rise. Mm. Uh, James Watt and uh, George Stevenson didn't know that. Right. You can hardly blame them right. for that. So I, I don't buy that. I think the people that argue for for reparations, that's just part of a, b a bigger sort of anti-Western yes. campaign. And a lot of people say, well... But our it, government falls for it, though. Well, they shouldn't. They yeah, shouldn't. But, yeah, they're not they backing. They're not. They're not backing the society. Their job is to look after us, right. not to not to shell out money. Not to look good after dinner parties. Exactly. Well, yeah. that's. The, I've argued many times, Mike. But that's the same reason they don't deal with the migrant crisis. Yeah. Because as middle class people, they don't want to uh, have a view that is 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 seem that seems to be sort of low status. Yes. And I'm afraid, you know, having a secure border is terribly old fashioned, and you can't you can't mm. say these things. But that's what the public want. Yeah, the public do want it, and the mm. public. Does Deserve to be given what they were promised at the election, don't aren't they? I mean, aren't they entitled to actually say, look, you know, we want our borders secure. Yeah. We don't want uh, people coming here in their thousands uh, mm. who are in, not entitled to be here, but who yeah. also not only are being, being given free accommodation, mm. but might actually get compensation because we didn't treat them very well. Yeah. No, the court. I mean, of course. really. But they, but the public ought to wise up, and uh, anything that they read in a, in one of the big parties' manifestos should be dealt with a degree of scepticism. I mean, they've the Tories have done this at every election for twenty or thirty years and have mm. done nothing about it. So I, w I just wouldn't believe them, frankly. I would, I would urge people to stop voting for these um, moribund yeah. parties. Once you've listened to that explanation, you can't do anything but agree with me, right? Well, well I can. I completely disagree with you. Uh, and you, as you, always, your argument is, I'm right because I'm always right. Well, unfortunately, it happens to be the yeah, case. Yeah, you, see, you yeah. see what I mean? Being right all the time is difficult. I can do it. You're wrong. Do you want to have a drink? Yeah. We don't always share the same view, but we can still share a drink. 
All opinions welcome at Talk TV, the home of common sense. Let's talk uh, for a moment, Ben, about what happens now with the Rwanda programme. Um, you've always been sceptical about it. Uh, I keep saying it's going to work. Uh, it's looking less and less likely at the moment, I have to say. Um, but they're now telling us that there's been another case yesterday uh, which was um, basically to postpone a hearing, uh, to adjourn a hearing until at least October now, by the looks of it. So the hope that something might happen in June has now gone. The hope that something might happen in September has now gone. Um, and it could well be, if anything happens in October, that it will be next year before anybody actually goes there. Meanwhile, we're seeing a £3 million a day hotel bill for asylum seekers, I think, just this year alone. I presume that's on top of the £5 million we were already paying. Um, it's just going on and on and on, isn't it? That's just hotel bills, £3 million, three million a day hotel bills. That's a billion a year on hotels. And, and you know, Mike, that whatever they tell us is a fraction of what they're actually spending. Um, Look, I mean, the real problem with the Rwanda uh, plan is that it is not border control. The real problem is that it's a policy for the deportation of illegal immigrants. Yeah. It's not a policy for border control. And the difficulty it faces is that every, uh, under human rights, every individual's claim needs to be individually heard. So if you've got 30,000 people entering the United Kingdom illegally, you've got 30,000 independent cases that need to be heard to deport or to make a decision on whether to deport one or all of them. You can't do it through some kind of class action or some you know, broader principle that's being applied. And therefore, it's never going to be a significant deterrent. Even if they send, how many people can they send to Rwanda, Mike? Even if our courts you know, suddenly became much more, um, you know, for want of a better word, compliant. You know, how many, how many, how many can we send? Hundreds? Well, it was only Maybe a few thousands? hundred. I think it was only a few hundred was the original plan, wasn't it? Yeah, 130. We ended up with one on the plane and mm. the European Court of Human Rights, <laughs> I, in my view, thankfully blocked the flight because it saves the exchequer of £400,000. But... Um, uh, the, the, the real issue here is border control. And I, I, and I heard the news just before I came on with you. There's a gentleman on it saying that actually Border Force and the Royal Navy are now just a taxi service. Mm. You know, if you want a deterrent, you cannot have our Border Force and our Royal Navy being viewed by illegal smugglers and would-be illegal migrants as a free taxi service to the United Kingdom. That is the opposite of a deterrent. They'll take their chances in British courts. Of course they will. Yeah. And if anyone thinks ditching the European Convention of Human Rights gets us over the line, it doesn't. No. Our own legal system is going to protect these people. And this is precisely what I mean about take, taking back genuine control, being prepared to... Uh, I'm going to be misquoted on this, I'm sure, but... Uh, apropos what we were discussing before, being prepared to move the goalposts for British national interest. Yeah. We have left the European Union. We are an independent sovereign state. As part of that, a fundamental part of that, we have to control our borders. There is only one way to deal with these migrants, and that is to push them back into French water, to refuse them safe passage, to... Um, uh, push their boats back into uh, French water, and if they jump out of their boats, which is what Border Force claim they do, do we either do not rescue them, mm. or we field a whole load of Rwandan boats. You know, we can finance these boats for Rwanda, because I know, as people have repeatedly told me, Rwanda does not have a coastline. I know, they always, they always say that, right? They go, oh, how stupid is Ben Habib? He thinks it's on the coast. We know it's not on the coast, guys, OK? Why, don't waste your tweets. But put a whole load of British finance Rwandan flag boats in the North Sea and they can rescue these yeah. people but also, and take them directly do, to Rwanda. All you've got to do, Ben, is look at the, the footage that we're seeing as, as you were speaking there of these boats. I mean, this is an industrial scale invasion by people it smugglers is. who have got money to make and who are not going to be put off uh, by some ludicrous bloke uh, wearing a couple of epaulets on his shoulders uh, telling them to go back the other right. way. They're not interested. These boats that they're coming on are industrial-scale smuggling operation boats. You know, they're carrying now more and more people. They're more and more... I mean, the idea of describing them as small boats is now ridiculous. It's redundant as a phrase. These are not small boats. These are not like the way they used to come across. Right. You know, when you'd get, you know, some people who were trying to, you know, uh, row their way 
across with some spades inside a child's paddling pool. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is mass movement of people in their thousands to live in a country illegally from which they will never be sent away. Absolutely. In hotels, being yeah. given pizza, being given food supplements because the pizza diet's not mm. that good. I don't know if you read that. They're now getting vitamin tablets, you know, courtesy of the exchequer. I mean, they're treated incredibly well yeah. when they get it. So, you know, moving rapidly on, if ever anyone accuses us of being xenophobic or institutionally racist, for goodness sake, look at the treatment these people get. And all the, all the voices in Parliament aren't about stopping these people coming across. Pretty's a lone voice. You know, the majority of the people are basically talking about ways of giving them safe passage, alleviating the problems that these uh, illegal migrants have. For goodness sake, you know, we can, ha we can have that debate, we can listen to their concerns, but in the first instance, we've got to take control of our borders and we've got to have a secure United Kingdom. You know, at the heart of a government's obligation is the defense of the realm. That starts with your borders. We are, as you said it, you said it, Mike, we're being invaded. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 30,000 is what we know of per annum. That's what we know of. And again, you and I know the figure is going to be much higher than that. Of course it is. Absolutely right. Ben, great to talk to you as ever. Thank you very much indeed. But we need to talk, I'm afraid, about Harry and Meghan because they're going to win uh, or they're going to be given an award, an anti-racism award, would you believe, uh, over in America, uh, the Joseph Kennedy Foundation, uh, because they've been so brave. Angela, very good afternoon to you. Do tell us Hello. about it. Well, um, they say that they've actually um, dared to attack the racism within the monarchy, which is one of the reasons why they're giving this. Um, however, who do you know of the royal family who's actually worn a swastika on well, his... There was Harry, I seem to remember, wasn't there? Ah, yes. He's the only one that's mm. only showed any sort of... Um, he also, did he not call a rather nasty name to somebody at Sandringham when he was training to be a, an officer yes, in the... when he was training an officer, the Pakistani... Yes. He was very, very rude to him. So um, this is a case of pot calling the kettle black. However, what's very interesting is something I've often thought, that you can lie your way through something the first time mm. because nobody looks at the second when people come and um, interrogate it and look at it and look at the facts and see if they are actually accurate. And this is what Kennedy's daughter, who's giving them this award, has done. It's all from Oprah Winfrey's interview. Yes. When we know it's absolutely packed with lies. And they, they've never come out and said who the person was who wonders of the colour of uh, Archie Skinwood. Yes. But, I mean, it's not a, it could have said, what's the colour of his hair going to be? That's not a racist comment. Um, well, also, uh, the, the, the comment was never attributed to anybody in particular. Exactly. And what we do exactly. know about that interview was that there were at least 37, I think, untruths in it, weren't there? Yeah, there were more untruths than there were truths, mm. actually. But you see, so that's one thing that this woman who's supposed to be very intelligent, she's got, she's a lawyer um, and she should know to investigate. You don't just take the top off the and, and go with that. Um, and so that's a nonsense. And the other thing about them showing no understanding of mental health is equally a nonsense because all the place, palaces are packed with medical people at your attention. Harry had a um, a help with mm. his medical condition, but he didn't want to tell his parents about it, so he could have done it himself. Yeah. And of course, Megan, who was nearly 40, would go to see an obstetrician every two or three weeks. And why didn't she say that to him or her? Yes. It's just a bag full of lies, and it's outrageous that they're going to be awarded the same day that um, the president of Ukraine is going to be awarded. How can they do that? It's outrageous. And I think that this is Harry to go against his family like that, to actually call them those names when he knows in his heart that's not true, mm. um, is really beyond disgraceful. Megha, of course, doesn't care because she's got her own view of the truth. Um, mainly non-truth. Yes. Well, that's her. That, well, she has. It's her belief, isn't it? That she does. She's already said in the past that she disregards anything that she may have said, which may be wrong, because it was her truth and it was her belief. Therefore, to her, it was true. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard.
Yes, it's nonsense. Mm. But people warm to it because they think, oh, this is a really original thinker. That's nonsense. Mm. I, I can't bear the thought that they're going to win an award for that because they're not humane. Right. Look at each other's family. You know, Meghan has taken him away from his father and his family and, and she only speaks to her mother. So she's got no... You can't just be very nice to odd people mm. that you choose. You have to be a humane person who treats the world and everybody in it, including your family, with respect. Mm. And I think she's brought out the most evil side of her. We all have a bad layer somewhere, mm. but we want people who bring out the best in us, not the worst. Yes. And Megan has definitely brought out the very worst in Harry. It's shameful. It really is. And the good news, though, for them is that if you wish to go and sit uh, with them at the Ripple of Hope Gala in New York on December the 6th, you can sit next to them and only cost you a million dollars. Yes, I know. I hope that they're getting too big for their ambitions. Mm. They'll all go pop. Um, because I think we've all had enough. Really, it's No, true. you're right. Listen, people are fed up to the back teeth. And I'm told in America people are getting fed up with them as well. Yes. Well, because they see the pile of lies coming ever higher and higher and higher. Um, and the arrogance about them and the way they feel. But also everything they said about the royal family in that Oprah Winfrey inf interview where he said that he had been cut off by his family, wrong, incorrect. His father had given him five million pounds the year before. He'd also got a 30 million pound trust fund uh, from his mother. Um, you know, I don't talk to my father, he won't take my calls. All of this rubbish about, you know, racism in the family and people su suggesting things and how she wasn't made to feel welcome. Well, why did they come back for the Queen's funeral? They didn't. Oh. They came back because they were doing some charity work, which they were also presumably getting paid for. Um, and then, because the Queen died, they hung around and they didn't seem to be uncomfortable at all being in the company of all these people that they so, that they so hate. Well, Meghan managed an artificial tear, at least I think it was, ah. because she did a, a, a website, not a, a tweet of her own, where she said the one thing she's learned is how to cry out of her left eye. Count to four, she said to the person, and watch me. Mm. And a tear came down. That was... Um, well, she is an actress, after all. Yeah, exactly. But uh, not all actresses can um, make tears. Um, but you think you hate this monarchy. Mm. You don't want to come. You don't want to have anything to do with it. Yet you're hanging on to the titles and you're arguing nonstop for titles for your children. Mm. Why? Why not ditch it all? Well, that's the other thing that she said, uh, that little Archie and Lily Betts were not getting titles because of racism. Well, guess what? Now they've got a title because they've moved one up in the pecking order after the yeah. death of the Queen. She hasn't gone back to, to Oprah and say, oh, I got that wrong, actually. Uh, they didn't get the titles because they were not next in line. Now they've got them, so I apologise to the royal family for making well, out that they were racist. Yeah, they've got them, but King Charles might not actually let them have them. I think they're working away to a huge explosion where he will be able to remove their titles. Mm. You know, there's a Labour MP in York who's um, done a private member's um, wish in Parliament that um, Prince Andrew does not have the title for York. They're yes. ashamed of him. And if this is heard and goes through on December the 10th or 9th, um, he will, the King will then have an opportunity to remove their title mm. should he want to. Yes, so because he doesn't he want them being left in any possible chance of running the country at any point, does he? Well, having anything to say because they you can't believe them, you can't trust them. That's what's terrible. Yes. Just it, can't trust. It really is. Yeah. Now, there's an, is there an upcoming visit to America from uh, William and Kate? Yes, William and Kate are going off in just over a week. Um, they'll do their um, bit with uh, William about climate change, but they'll also go around and see people. I'm sure they won't visit... Harry and Meghan because they're bound to have an extremely busy mm. few days there. But the idea is to get America to like them and to show a balance within the royal family from Harry and Meghan. It's very, very well timed yes. because although they might be winning, where Harry and Meghan will be winning this award, uh, people are disgusted in America because they can see they've done nothing compared to real, true um, people, philanthropists. And um, they will see how wonderful a couple they are and how they really care and how good they are with children. Megan often gets pushed away by little children. It's really funny when she...
assemble photographs where they push her out the way. Mm. No, exactly right. And I saw the other story at the weekend that I just want to mention is that um, now that Princess Meghan isn't happy with the house in Montecito, they want to move to Bel Air. Yes, they want to move to Bel Air because their house at £40 million, pounds, which most of us would never be able to get to anyway, is very cheap, uh, according to other people in their area. Some of them have got them up to £100 million and all mm. that sort of stuff. So she wants to go to another place, claiming perhaps that it'd be nicer and quieter. She doesn't want quiet. She wants everybody making a noise and shouting hooray for her. <laughs> but they think there's an, another place that will... Um, that they can go to. She can't stay very long with anything, can she? She Other seems than... to have a very short attention span. And whenever anybody says anything which is mildly something that she doesn't like, she's off. Yes, yeah, she's off, but she also changes her mind of what, what she wants to do. One minute it's, it's being a, a global star, the next minute it's writing uh, another book, then it's sort of doing being uh, in a film, being the, having the lead in a film. Um, she's, she's a very unsatisfiable woman. You, mm. she's not, however much she gave her, I'm sure she would want more. She's just one of those types of women. I'm not very nice about her, but then I don't think she's been very nice. He's back and he's uncensored. Debating the breaking news and talking to the biggest names. Piers Morgan is live every week with a host of stars. Uncompromising, unmissable, and uncensored. And remember, if you're thinking it, we're talking about it. Piers Morgan, Uncensored, Monday to Thursday at 8pm on Talk TV.